Hi everybody. First of all, can you all hear me? Yes. That always helps. Um, tough gig. End of two days. I have me next. I'm going to try and keep the energy up. Um, I'm going to try and give you a practical view of what we've done in the last couple of years. Uh, to keep it as practical as possible. Um, aware that you're all from different organisations of different sizes, and you know what we do won't fit every organisation, but. Um, I've been listening in on the talks the last few days. I haven't been here. Um, so, you know, amazing talks like Scott's this morning was fantastic. I heard Maeve yesterday talk. Uh, I didn't hear everybody's, but I was picking up ideas as I went along, and I hope that that's what we get out of the next one. Um, so, so let's start. When I attend these things, and somebody who has a collection and um, gets up and speaks and doesn't show me any of that collection at a talk, I'm really pissed off. So, <laughs> so let's start with a with a clip. Is a 
So I just thought with the subject matter for this conference, and I know there's a lot of talk about digital and uh, you know modern kind of connections, but really the themes are the very same. You know, it's about connecting with who your users are, who your community is. Um, as you'll see in a couple of slides, on, I'm a big fan of storytelling, and to me that's storytelling that really hasn't changed. We still want to connect with people no matter what our collections are. So having softened you up with that, I have a confession to make, and I'll use my own archive to make this. Uh, I'm not a librarian, I don't have any qualifications as a librarian, and I don't have any qualifications as an archivist. So, <laughs> But I will promise you <laughs> to get back. There'll be two more videos before I'm finished talking, and if you're really bored with me talking, you can always go online and have a look at the site that I'm talking about. So there you go. Um, so the, the, the idea of these two photographs, again, are just to give you some um, idea maybe of where my thinking comes from about you know, my approach to stuff. The photograph on the left, is that's me with my head in my hands when I had hair. Um, I have uh, a background in making documentaries as well as an independent documentary maker, uh, usually, making, usually using archive. So I was a user of not just archives, not all audiovisual archives only, but libraries. I spent an awful lot of time on two particular documentaries I made in uh, both the National Library and uh, Dublin City Library in Pier Street. Hours before you could, because when I was doing this, a lot of stuff wasn't available online. There was no online. The other side of the house is when I was often doing two things. That's uh, my student pass to a course I did in George Eastman House as a film archivist uh, back in, where is it, 1998. Well, that's how long ago it is. So that kind of informs a lot of the, what I'm going to talk to you about, hopefully. gives you some idea of where I'm coming from. Um, so what we do at RT Archives, we, we have this tagline we kind of came up with ourselves a few years ago, and we haven't found a better one. Um, RT has a unique record of audiovisual life, if you think about it. You know, radio's around since 1926, TV since 1961. I'm not going to go into what our collections are here today. That's a whole other talk, and it'll take too long. But what I will say, what, I'm, what we do in terms of publishing and bringing those collections in the last couple of years, uh, my job to an outside world to give some kind of access is really just a shop front to what an awful lot of other people do in RT archives. I mean, we've got there's two of my colleagues here who catalog material. We have people in radio who work with, we have technicians who work on preserving our material. What we do is bringing all of those people's work to the forefront. That's basically what it is in, in a nutshell. Um, and so what I'm going to concentrate on for the, the purposes of this this talk is kind of these four things, I suppose, and it's again from my perspective. RT Archives, really its primary function is to serve program makers. We don't have a physical space that we can invite the public into. We're not like the National Library or the National Gallery that way. There is no National Audiovisual Archive in Ireland. It's unusual in most countries now that there isn't one, but there isn't one. And, but we're very conscious in RT that we have this amazing collection and we'd like to find ways to make that available to the public. We're public funded, and that would be my personal belief that we should find ways to do it. It's also an RT commitment to do it. It's easier said than done, though, to be honest. But for the last few years, we've been, we've been trying to do that, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of access. The second part is the connection bit, and lots of you have been talking about connections and how you connect with your community. I suppose the nice thing about technology, and it's a double-edged sword from my point of view, and I'll explain that in a while, is technology allowed us to do this. It allowed us to take our acetate discs, our quarter inch tape, our film off shelves and maybe digitize it some way and provide you with access to it. The double edged sword bit for us comes in that we can digitize to publish something online but that is not digitizing to preserve it for the long term future. That's the balancing act we're playing with what we're doing. So by me providing you access, is that doing good or bad? I'll come back to that towards the end. The, sec the third thing is awareness, and I'm just always curious when I do these talks, how many people would have known what RT have heard of RT archives before this conference? Okay, that's pretty good. A couple of years ago, if I had asked that question to the same size room, I don't think we'd have had that recognition. We're about 18 months doing this format you're going to look at now, and I think that has actually helped increase our, our profile. Um, just one brief thing on the access, because I'm not going to go into it. I'm going to just talk about the access that we do online. We, but people always say, we'd love to get access to RT archives. And one of our counter things to them is, you already get access every single day. For example, 27% of the main evening news is archived. Once something goes out on air, it's archived. That's what it is. Uh, obviously, there are lots of programs reading in the years. John Bowman's program in the morning, they use the archive that way. 
My job is to try and find ways to use OT archives in those non-traditional areas, so not in radio or broadcast, non-traditional for, for OTE. The value bit, I'll come back to the very end, and in terms of, you know, what did all of doing, taking this approach do for us? You know, what did it do for our collections? And maybe, again, there might be some, some learnings for you on that. Okay, so when we sat down a couple of years ago to decide, you know, we're, we're, going, we're going to revamp our website. Our website is actually in its third iteration now. Um, if I showed you the first one, you wouldn't believe, you know, how basic it was. But, you know, we, we had that ambition quite early to go with it. And perhaps a little unusually, uh, we, did, we, we did this project with a very small team, all in-house, and it was uh, myself with the, uh, with the content person, we had a project manager, a designer, and a developer. And one of the first things I insisted they all do was they went to every single area of the archive to learn about it. So we went around and spoke to everybody, got everybody's input, so that these people coming in had some idea of what it was we were trying to do. And we sat down and decided what would we like, what would the personality we would like some people don't like when I use that word, but I like this idea of RTR as having a personality. And we want it to be known as somewhere that could be trusted. It, could be, you know, it was modern. It was engaging with an audience. It could be amusing. It could be surprising. Um, the flexible bit was important to me that we need to be able to move quickly. If something changes, how can we uh, adapt to that or how can we, we um, connect with that? And the last bit is relevant. So we were doing this for a while and... Um, uh, we currently publish two ways, and I'm not going to go into the mechanics of that because, again, that's a whole other talk, but just to give you two, the two broad ways we do it. One is the traditional way of an exhibition. So if you're, you go to the National Gallery or the National Library, we came up with a theme, we pull material related to that and put it online with a whole list of metadata on it. And we started off doing things that way, and what we found very quickly was you publish one of those and you get a huge interest in it and then it falls away very quickly. So what we cottoned on to in all of this, I, I continually think we're learning as we go about stuff, is that if we could publish stuff every single day, then we'll have an audience every single day. What's interesting is they're not the same audience, and I'll explain why that happens, but we have an audience every day. So last year, uh, 2016, we literally published items 365 days a year. We published something new every, every single day last year. So I did promise another video, and I'm going to give you an example of... Um, a exhibition piece. That was an exhibition that, uh, that we put together. That's a, you can actually go to one location, and it's called The Weird and Wonderful. And they're little quirky stories that often appeared at the end of, you know, the shaggy dog story at the end of the news. They're that kind of thing, and we pull them all to place. 
I love them. I think that says so much about Ireland, you know, what a kind of a fun, inventive, don't care kind of place um, we can be, you know. Um, so that, that's that exhibition idea. But, uh, and that video there that we did, we put that together and we released that through the press and through social media with the idea, hope of driving people back to the website. So we give a little bit away in the hope that we'll get you, you interested. So I'm hoping that I've shown it to you all, you'll all go away now and look at the, the full stories on, on the website. Um, I saw, did, did, has anybody ever heard of Roger Felber? I'm not surprised, but I'm going to tell you who he is. He's a really interesting man. Roger Felber is, was a businessman who in 2008 bought back British Pathé Newsreel. And um, I saw him speak at a conference a couple of years ago. It was amazing. He did no PowerPoint, no images or anything. He just, he just spoke. And he very kindly summed up what we were doing in these three phrases. He said, what you need to be is reliable, regular, and relevant. Um, I was kind of relieved to know we were already doing them, but we had slightly different labels on them. But the, it's really stuck with me that you know, this is what you need to do if you want to make that connection. So being reliable for RT archives, and then you can all think of your own collections in this term, um, you know, RT for lots of reasons, some of them good and some of them not so good, um, and again, that would be part of my role, I think, to say, look, hands up, we got stuff wrong in the past, or to try and explain to you why why um, we didn't record things, or white tapes were wiped in the past, you know, we'd have to say that. But nowadays, and for the last 10 or 15 years, everything is recorded and kept. And we, we, we want people to see us as that kind of trusted environment. That's part of what we do in showing you this stuff, that we've got this great collection, and we look after it really well. So we would have called Rogers Reliable Trusted. Um, the regular bit, and this is, this is to go back to what I said, the way we publish. As I said, we publish now 365 days. If you're not familiar with us through Twitter or Facebook or our own website, at around 10 o'clock weekdays, you'll see three new stories appear every day. So we publish three new stories every single day. And with a small team, what that means is we'll dig out the stories, we'll write the stories, we'll edit the video, edit the audio, um, and we'll publish it then through social media channels. Um, uh, at the weekends, if you're looking at the weekends, we actually publish slightly earlier. It's the only part where we auto-publish. Um, we auto-publish on a Saturday and a Sunday, but we don't auto-publish uh, any of our social media. That's all done uh, live. So getting social, and I heard lots of people talk about social media. Um, we, we did it um, with just three social media channels. Um, and there's kind of a story behind each one, and why did you use one? And I heard May from ITMA talk yesterday. I wasn't here, but I heard her describe the amount of channels that they had tried out and, uh, you know, ones that they were sticking and weren't sticking with. It, for me, it was very easy. When I, when I got the go-ahead to do this initially in RTE, it was just me doing it. And so I went for the one that was resource light. And those of you who uh, are on Twitter will know Twitter is resource light, and it, can, it allows you a lot. People give out it's got an, age or, an older age profile now, um, it's still, you know, it's still very big. You know, people talk about the decline of Twitter. Look at the numbers; it's still very, very big. Um, Facebook is a little trickier. We, we're only doing Facebook for over a year, and it's trickier again for those of you maybe who manage uh, business pages of Facebook. You'll know that there's the dark arts of the algorithm of Facebook, and you know how does that work, and blah blah blah. But we still find it. We find it very useful. Social media, I'll sum up, is very important for us in that our biggest referrals come through. Uh, social media, other people's social media. We rely on other people um, to use their f Facebook pages, their Twitter accounts to say, would you have a look at this? It's hilarious, you know, and uh, send it on to us that way. The third one, um, I don't know if anybody has ever heard of Vine. Some people have. Um, Vine was, for those of you who weren't, is dead now. We, we were quite heavy users of it for three years. It allowed you to have, um, to record six seconds of video and release it through uh, Twitter or Facebook. We just used it through Twitter ourselves. Um, and we used to use it early on when we weren't available on mobile devices, and it was a kind of a way, again, to show people really quickly. The really sad thing about Twitter, if, um, or with Vine, um, if there's anybody from Twitter watching this, it would be really handy because I've been onto them, is they, Twitter took over Vine and promised that when they shut down Vine, they would keep the platform and keep your videos available. Um, they haven't done that. Uh, well, we can't access ours at the moment, so. I've been on to, to, to see if we can do that again. But it was a useful thing, but that's the one down the bottom. We don't use that anymore. Uh, I, I should have also said, I don't use any social media personally. I, it's just not my bag, but I'm kind of aware of, of, of how this stuff 
this stuff works. Um, for those of you who aren't maybe or, or aren't familiar with what it looks like, or you know, this is what a typical tweet would look like in our timeline. So this is a tweet from this morning from a story we have today about Noel Gallagher being on the, the Late Late Show. And uh, a, a kind of a byproduct, I actually left that delivery down below Fintan O'Toole. That's Fintan O'Toole's the Irish Times replying to something we tweeted yesterday. It just happens to be on our timeline below. So uh, the way we use it is very simple. We put up what it is. Um, on this day, 2012, this happened, and here's a link to watch it. And we do the same on our Facebook page, and then we hope that we put it out there, push it out, let it go, and then see uh, what kind of response we get. It's taken us a while, but people are kind of used to us doing that now. This is kind of, I don't know how much of that you can see. This is me, I suppose, uh, imitating the back of a, uh, a novel. These are all the kind of, you know, endorsements we've got. But really, the reason I want to put them up is because one thing I've learned about we ha what we have as an audience, we don't have one great audience. RTE has a responsibility to, to serve the public. That's a, we're a public service broadcaster, and we hit a very wide area. But what we've learned from what we do is we have a lot of very, very small audiences. So what I mean by that is you might have no, you might be really interested in Oasis, so you will retweet the Noel Gallagher clip today and not come back to us for months on end or maybe never again, or you'll pass it to people who are. So for that day, you are our audience, but the next day, you're not. So usually, bounce rate on websites is seen as a very negative thing, but it needn't necessarily be so if you've got a lot of people you know, coming and going, coming and going. Ideally, we'd like to keep people, and we do see that growing, that we, we're seeing people return to us. So these are different kind of engagements. A couple, I'm going to just uh, show you a few that are kind of, um, uh, I suppose, very obvious, some of them, but you know, things that happen to us. So the top one there, you can just see I've kind of covered this one here. You can see on this day in 1990, that was Kylie Minogue arriving in Dublin. Um, one of the things we'll do, and you probably saw it on the previous tweet there, is we'll tag people. Now, you've got to be really careful, guys, about how you tag people in these things. Don't annoy people to, to death. You know, our, our thing, we treat ta a tag like, hey, look, did you see yourself on this? We'll only tag somebody if they're relevant to the tweet. Um, so we tagged Kylie Minogue and either we like to think it was Kylie herself, but I presume it was her people, um, picked it up and came back on it. And suddenly you get a huge uplift of something like that, if something like that happens on it. You know? um, Salman Rushdie was another one, uh, across on the left there. Um, but they're, they're the kind of big hitters that are obviously a great help. But sometimes it's the smaller ones, it's the harder audiences to, to chase that uh, give us as much pleasure. So this one down here, I'll just read this one out so you can, for those of you who can't see it maybe, it says, Hi guys, just thought you would like to hear this. I was in first day of uh, Leaving Cert History today and we were studying modern Irish history and the teacher said to use the archive site and social media as a source for revising, researching, studying. So that, that was a guy called Harry McCann uh, who came in, spent one day with us, had no idea what was doing. I remember him showing him a, a CD and he didn't know what a CD was because he's, <laughs> he's completely digital, you know, com completely born digital, you know. Um, but he was blown away by what we were doing, and he's become, a, he's a kind of a champion of young people. Uh, he's on the, he'll kill me now for not remembering the name of this, but uh, a Digital Council of Ireland. You'll see him, just, he's called at the Harry McCann, looking at, looking at him with great things. But that's somebody who came on into us, had no idea before on what we were doing. That's an age group that's obviously very hard for us to reach, because uh, they don't watch television, um, or they don't watch radio, so, and everything is so old to them. Um, a couple of other ones that, you know, I just love some of the ones. Sometimes they're really surprising. The one above that, um, we tweeted out about a 43-year-old cow, Big Bertha, which gave birth for the 39th time. And above it, this, uh, this is the uh, retweet from um, a farmer in New Zealand. Now, again, just read that for those people who can't read it. This Irish fella has a 43-year-old beef cow. It's just calved. The cow was born in 1973. Fuck. <laughs> Um, so again, you know, completely different audience, and that's the kind of thing. He, we don't know whether we'll ever come back again, but you know, he saw something that engaged him for however brief the thing that is. Some of the other ones across the way, they're, they're kind of really nice. Hurdy Gurdy Museum, people are probably aware of that out in Hoat. Um, really great supporter of ours, um, and you know, they would say really nice things. And that, I put that one up there because it's about getting involved in a conversation. So our accounts, we'll tweet about stuff we like that is relevant to our account. I won't tweet about EastEnders last night, 
but I might tweet about a, an amazing set of photographs that is, I've seen in a Chicago museum. It can be anywhere. We'll tweet about things like that. So get involved if you're looking after those things. Get involved in other people's conversation. It's not all about you or your account, I suppose what I'm saying. Um, some of the other ones over there that are, are kind of major endorsements are they're online journalists. Um, but it's really, it's just the point of this slide really is to show you the different kind of engagements you can get. There's one other one, sorry, that just happened the other day that I, that I would read out that I really liked. Um, I don't know Orla O'Donnell. She's a journalist in RTE, but I don't know her. And she tweeted, I don't know if there's any more chilling notification for a TV journal on Twitter than seeing that at RTE Archive has tagged you in a post. <laughs> what she's referring to is there that we're usually t putting up stories that are 10 years old and you know, the journalist is now seeing themselves 10 years ago reporting something. And that got picked up by a whole, her tweet got picked up by a whole load of people. Okay, so the, 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 the next um, Roger piece was about relevance. And relevance is a harder thing to get. And, but again, you need to think from your collection point of view, what's relevant to your audience or to your audiences. And this is an example from January this year um, where we tweeted out, it was an, on this day, that there was a, uh, a major snowfall in 1982. And it just happened that the day we tweeted it out was, do you remember that week in January where are we going to have snow, are we not going to have snow, and you know this country and snow, we really can't cope with it at all. <laughs> um, and it also tied into a, a whole lot of people remembering this particular snowfall. So we tweeted out, snow causes major disruptions on this day in 1982. And that page was seen 177,000 times in the month of January, um, which even is pretty pretty big. I, I haven't gone into the mechanics of how the website works, but we're able to link other material to it. This is our top 10 stories from the following day. And by having, having our, our content connected, seven of the stories are related to snow. So again, if you can find something that's relevant. So what I mean by relevant there was it was an anniversary to a really big snow event that happened in 1982. Weather was on people's minds on that day. And then you've got a whole audience waiting out there for you and then people are swapping because it's, it's an event that a lot of people you know, of that age group will remember and share or show their kids or whatever. You know. So that's a rel one example of relevance. Here's another example of relevance and the, the last video I'll show you. So lead up to the, to the uh, US elections, uh, RTE goes big on the US elections, as you know. Got them two minutes, I'm told. I better hurry here fast. Um, and uh, we, again, are looking for something that's relevant to, to us. We ha already had all of those little icons you saw are direct stories on our website about US presidents visiting here. We put together that piece, release it on social media, tie it into the fact that RTE will be covering the, the events and that this that people can get have a look back at, at US President Spingo. Other examples of relevance, because I think this is really important if you can get this right. So the top one there, um, about small audiences, niche audiences again, break dancers. There's a whole you know heap of people out there who were break dancers. It's amazing in the music and that. Limerick, a location. If you've got something about a particular area, that works really as well. So that's two in that one. Uh, Donald Trump's mother, another one that worked well in the lead up to, to the US presidential election uh, by the time we did it on. Um, I must forget the name of this, the, the 2040 structural plan. Do you, do you notice that was announced by the government there last week? Um, again, this story just happened to be that week, but we tagged it with the same one that the government was using because it's about a lack of regional planning back in 1982, and it became part of the conversation that way. So that's what I'm referring to by, about being relevant. Uh, I have a whole other heap of things. We're probably going to just quiz through these. But I did want to do this because, again, I'm conscious that not everybody would have huge resources or big teams to throw at people. But here's two examples of really simple things we did. 
This first one here was for 2014, very non-digital. We used audio recordings and took the quotes from them. So each of those quotes are from veterans from the First World War. And we made up posters and posted them around Dublin without any kind of announce announcement before a major event in Dublin and before the launch of a website related to World War I. So people were going, what, what is this? You know, a whole generation of things. Very non-digital, very old school, uh, worked really well for us. I've now just been cut off, so, we'll <laughs> so I'm going to finish by saying I'm, I'm not even going to get into this whole thing. But I do, I will leave you on this. Give me one minute to finish up, because I think this is important. I want to just, for maybe for people to take away with you. If I had three takeaways for you guys, it would be, you know, get to know your audience. Know who your audience is, um, and make a connection with them. So you need to listen to what they want or what they require or how you can fulfill that. Roger Felber's three R's I've taken you through. Three things that we learned, and they're all kind of connected. If we provide access, and that is a really tricky thing for RT Archives to do because we're looking for the money to preserve our collections for the future. By providing a digital online stuff, people automatically assume we have preserved that stuff for the future. Anything I've shown you today isn't there yet. We need the money to do that. Um, but we've created an awareness by doing that. I think we, you know, that's part of what we show. Value. Value comes in a, a number of different ways for me. By us publishing material, I think we've shown that something that wouldn't have been a, maybe a, a, as aware three years ago. We've got a wonderful collection of stuff. We think it's really worth preserving, that it's something Ireland should preserve. So by showing some of the material, we hope that that demonstrates the value to it. The second one is a value to our own staff, to show the value of the work they are doing, the people I described at the very start. You demonstrate the value of what they are doing, the people who are looking after this material. And I've got to leave it at that. And Shine, and if you are interested, now you know where to follow us and have a look on that. Thank you. This is a whole other discussion. No, I do know. Um, I, I was explaining to somebody at lunchtime. I, uh, I'll probably take. I'll answer this as quickly as possible. And if you want to ask me afterwards, there's lots of reasons why material may not survive. Ask any broadcaster in the world, a TV broadcaster. Quickest answer is: if it was on videotape, videotape was so expensive, TV was seen as ephemeral. What they did was, you taped over it, you used it again, so there was no, there's no problem. If it was on film, you couldn't tape over film, you couldn't record again over film, so if it's on film, we probably have it. 